Piper the Misery Machine. I'm Yergi. And I'm Drewby. And out back is Callie, the Calico Cow. And this is Prada, or Little Bean. And this week we're doing a case that has been requested many times, ever since our second Delphi update. And that's the Floor of Fire. Yeah, it's a really interesting case. It's a really sad case. And there's a huge shame that it didn't get the media attention that it deserved. Yes, and also we're going to be covering on some other topics. We have a small Brian Chadwell update that we'll be doing, which is also a case we'll be covering that a lot of people think is in connection with the Delphi murders and it's out of Iowa. So we'll be touching on that as well. And if we think that the person responsible for that is the person responsible for the Delphi murders. Also, one last housekeeping thing. We're, we've heard your requests. We're going to be covering more states involving CPS, child abuse, things of that nature. Now, when we did Maine, obviously we have a little more information because we live here, but the problem with a lot of these cases aren't covered by local media that well. So I need you guys' help. If you want me to do your state, I need you to send me cases. So in the comments below, if you can put, you know, cases where there's like these uh, covered up child abuse, CPS gone wrong, social workers, uh, mishandling cases, anything like that, please leave that in the comment section. If you're not listening on YouTube, miserymachinepodcast at gmail.com. That will help us be able to do more episodes like that, which y'all have requested. Absolutely. And if you are listening on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe. We have just passed 19,000 subscribers. Thank you so much, everyone, for the help so Thank far. Thank you so much. That's incredible. Yes, it is. But without further ado... The Floor of Fire and more. Tracy Rose and his family were excited to build a new life for themselves in the tiny Indiana town of Flora, which runs along Route 18 and is roughly 15 minutes southeast of the infamous town of Delphi. With a total area of 1.06 square miles and a population just over 2,000 residents, Flora seemed like the perfect place for a new beginning. Rose had gone to prison for drug crimes when his daughter Galen was 12. In 2011, he came back into her life and into the lives of his grandchildren after he was released from prison and became sober. He moved to Flora when his aunt found him work there. Galen Rose, now 29 years old, at times struggled as a single mother. She eventually followed him to Flora from Missouri to be close to family. She and her daughters Keone, Cariel, Kiara, and Kiana lived with her father for eight months until Galen secured her own apartment with more space. The apartment, which was located on the first floor of a duplex, had a large front porch on a tree-lined street. The girls were often playing with each other outside and were described as friendly and polite, often saying hello to those that lived nearby. On Friday, November 20th, 2016, Tracy Rose was supposed to be packing for a trip to Tennessee. He was plagued with a feeling that he didn't want to go out of town, though he wasn't sure why. Rose lived in a small white house, just blocks from where his daughter and granddaughters lived. The girls, who called him Papa, had come to help him pack for the trip. They asked him not to go. The girls had a busy weekend ahead of them. They had a cheerleading competition on Saturday. Then, on Sunday, Kiana, the oldest, had a basketball game. Kiana loved basketball, and Rose predicted that she'd be a star in high school. He often went to her games, cheering her on from the sidelines. While in Tennessee, he phoned Galen for a play-by-play -play of Kiana's game. However, just hours after the game, Tracy was awoken by a call that no parent or grandparent even expects to receive. It was Galen. She said his granddaughters had been killed after the duplex home she shared with the girls caught fire. The day after the fire, the Department of Homeland Security, in a statement, so the cause of the blaze was still undetermined. But it may have started in the kitchen of the lower unit, where Galen Rose's family lived, possibly behind the refrigerator. However, two months later, the state fire marshal's office released information that rocked Flora. Investigators found accelerants in the structure and ruled it an arson fire. On May 25, 2017, the fire was ruled as intentional, by Homeland Security. Investigators declined to talk more about the investigation and would not offer more details about the type of accelerants found. 
Officials have not released information about any suspects. They say they're no longer publicly speaking about the case. It remains under investigation. Within a year of the fire occurring, both investigators and prosecutors assigned to the case have stepped down after questions about the investigation arose. The biggest mystery in Flora lies inside the corner duplex. State investigators have said the fire that killed the girls was arson, but what exactly happens is shrouded in secrecy. A man named Mike Vergen is one of the people who has been inside the house since the fire. He runs his own fire investigation company. He was hired by Galen Rose and her attorney. Vergen spent more than 15 years as a certified fire investigator with the ATF before starting his own company. He has been to more than 1,000 fire scenes and investigated this one just one week after it happened. When asked about his findings and where he discovered the fire started, Vergen responded, quote, I can't really say right now because, and I'll tell you why, if we get to a point in the investigation that they make an arrest, the only people that should know where the fire started is the person who said it and the investigators, end quote. Vergen believes the fire was an arson, but the goal was not to kill the children. He is also not sure whether everything possible is being done to solve the case. He also noted that working smoke alarms may be the only thing that could have saved the girls. Galen Rose has filed a federal wrongful death lawsuit against the landlord claiming there were no working smoke detectors. The uncertainty has led to a creeping anxiety in the town, particularly when paired with another recent tragedy suffered in Carroll County. Just eight miles from Flora, Liberty German and Abigail Williams were killed in Delphi in February, another unsolved killing that has resulted in unease and suspicion. And again, we didn't know about this fire in Flora and the suspicious circumstances surrounding it until we were covering Delphi and many locals suggested this case to us. Mm -hmm. People in town have speculated on who might have set the fire, including wondering if any family members could have done it. Tracy Rose believes the fire was an accident and is upset about the rumors swirling around town. He says the family has no enemies in Flora. Flora has commemorated the six girls with a bench engraved with each girl's name and age. Flowers lay on the seat. Police are also offering a reward up to $5,000 for information that leads to an arrest. Citizens can donate to the reward fund by sending a check to the Indiana Department of Homeland Security at 302 West Washington Street, room E. 208 Indianapolis, Indiana 46204. To ensure the donation goes to the appropriate account, the memo line should read Flora Fire Reward. And we'll have that information in the description. So you might be wondering, why haven't you heard of this case before? We hadn't really heard of this case before no. we started looking into Delphi. And why in particular Delphi is more or less one of the more popular cases in Indiana, at least either missing persons or homicide. Well, there's a phenomenon out there and I just kind of wanted to share it with you. And I don't want this to cause a whole bunch of stir in the comments talking about politics or wokeness or anything. This is actually a real phenomenon. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So there is a phenomena out there called missing white woman syndrome, and it is a term used by social scientists in the media to refer to extensive media coverage, especially in television, of missing persons cases and murders involving young, white, middle, upper class women and girls. The term is used to describe Western media's disproportionate focus on upper middle class white women who disappear compared to coverage of missing non-white women, women of lower social classes, and missing men or boys. We're sticking up for men here too. Right. So this is something that you see generally in the United States, Canada, Australia, the UK, and South Africa. We've talked about this multiple times. We just never called it this. Mm -hmm. And... You know, this is a point I've tried to bring home time and time again when we cover serial killers or killers in general that have targeted the homeless, targeted sex workers, targeted people of color, targeted indigenous people, how police don't put enough resources into these people. And that's not something that can be argued. Like, there's no argument there. That is fact. Right. So 
while you may be troubled by the term missing white woman syndrome. It's literally just what it's called. I, I think the term might repel some people initially, but when you look at the meaning behind it, obviously there's some factual ground there. There is. And I'd never heard of this before until Yergi brought this up to me very recently, and I read a paper on it that came out from the College of William and Mary. And yeah, this is something we've been talking about forever. We just never knew there was an official term for it. Yeah, so in addition to race and class, factors such as supposed attractiveness, body size, youthfulness are often criteria in the determination of newsworthiness in the coverage of missing women. So let's think about that. When a woman or a girl goes missing... How often are they attractive? How often can you put their face all over a news bulletin day after day after day? Right. And we're not just talking about missing persons. This includes murder, murder as well. So let's let's think about it. You know, you have John Bonet, which was a very beautiful little blonde girl. A lot of these She's these, a model. Right. A lot of these people are blonde. Think about it this way as well. So when you get to news coverage of missing black women, the news is more likely to focus on the victim's problems, such as abusive boyfriends, troubled past, possible drug use. Socioeconomic situation. Yes. Well, white people coverage, specifically with these white women, tends to focus on the roles as mothers, daughters, whatnot. We had a case up here in Maine, and it wasn't even someone who had went missing or was murdered. It was simply a high school girl was very popular and pretty, who had some sort of heart condition they didn't know about, and she dropped dead during some sort of sporting event. Now, that is tragic. That is a horrible thing that happened to her. But this made national news and was in the news for a really long time. Yeah, we've had people of color go missing here, or people get murdered here in heinous ways. We have unsolved murder cases here that don't get resources from our state barely at all, and those don't make national news. I mean, even further, you look at the Kimberly Moreau, you look at the Luger Belanger cases, the state will block federal help in trying to solve these cases. So it's, it's an interesting comparison. Yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon. I don't want to get too deep into this because it is so interesting that I think it in the future would deserve a its own episode. Its own episode. I just want to kind of cover a few examples here so you know what I'm talking about. So I'm pretty sure everyone is very familiar with the Lacey Peterson case where her husband, Scott Peterson, killed her and put her out in the ocean while she was pregnant with her son, Connor. What a lot of people don't know is there was also a 24-year-old woman named Evelyn Hernandez who was almost nine months pregnant. She was a Salvadoran immigrant, and she also had an American six-year-old son. She went missing in San Francisco, and her torso was found in San Francisco Bay three months later, and her baby, Alex, was never found. And this happened relatively close to the Lacey Peterson Right. Case, so. It happened July 24th, 2002. Another one that most people would know of is the Jessica Lynch capturing the prisoner of war, whereas she wasn't the only person captured, nor was she the one captured for the longest. There was Shoshana Johnson, who I believe was Jessica Lynch eight days. Yeah, two, Jessica two Lynch weeks. was eight days. Shoshana was... 23 in there for 23 days. 23 to almost a month. And then there was Lori Pistella. I don't, I'm not sure how to say it. it's a Hopi name, which is um, nat a Native American tribe. She was also captured and she mortally died. wounded, and she died while captured by Iraqi forces. You know, those names I never even knew about. Jessica Lynch, obviously, all over the news. And I, I never even heard the name Shoshana Johnson. Right. And, and, she, and she was a, a black single mother. Mm -hmm. And despite being captured longer than Jessica Lynch, got less of a payout from the military. So another case, I think this is probably the last one I'm going to mention because I don't want to go all over the place, is Natalie Holloway. She's still in the news. And she was a high school senior that went missing in Aruba during her senior class trip. So she was murdered by a Dutch national named Joran van der Sloot. They never recovered her body, but it's thought that she was possibly killed and taken out to sea. 
So that still is in the news. You can see her picture everywhere. She's very, very noticeable. What a lot of people don't talk about is there was also a 21-year-old Peruvian business student named Stephanie Flores who was murdered in a hotel room by Joran Vandersloot, and nobody talks about it. And this happened relatively close. Right, within a few years. By the same person, but nobody wants to talk about that one. So if you're wondering why we bring this up, well, when countless numbers of locals bring this to our attention and ask, why isn't this getting national coverage? This could be why. And again, this is no disrespect to Abby and Libby's case. We want that solved more than anything. However, a lot of people have asked us to look into some sort of explanation why that could be. And this is what we found. Now, with Delphi in mind, uh, let's go forward to another listener suggestion that I'll say up front. You may be wondering why we're talking about this. Well, it's believed that this could have ties to the Delphi case. So this is the Evansdale murders, and I'll go into this briefly. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because police have stated they don't believe the two are connected, but it's worth mentioning because there's so many similarities. And it was talked about a lot online, and there's a lot of people, locals and non-locals, that thought that these two cases are connected. So (laughs) it should be explained. Absolutely. So cousins Elizabeth Collins, eight years old, and Lyric Cook, 10 years old, were out riding bikes in the Myers Lake area of Evansdale, Iowa on Friday, July 13th, 2012, when they went missing. Their bodies were found some five months later in the neighboring Bremer County in a desolate wooded area known as the Seven Bridges Wildlife Area. Seven Bridges is known for being an area where transients go to deal drugs, often meth, and where people go to engage in otherwise illegal or unsavory activities. It is also known as a place where hunters frequent, and it was hunters who found the girls' bodies. The girls' bikes and Lyric's cell phone were found less than two hours into the search, having been abandoned on a trail at Myers Lake. No cause of death has been released by the authorities. So this is where it gets similar. So both cases involved young females between the ages of 8 and 14. Both girls went missing together as a duo. The girls were murdered while together, which indicates a proficient criminal or more than one offender. All were heading off to play or hang out together when they went missing. Lyric and Elizabeth were riding bikes and Abby and Libby were walking on a wooded trail. You see the similarities immediately. The bodies were all found in areas a hunter might frequent. Both sets of girls went missing shortly after 2 p.m., Lyric's grandmother last saw the girls around 12.20 p.m. and reported them missing around 2 p.m. The Snapchat photo of Abby was taken at 2.07 p.m. and the photo of the bridge guy was taken at 2.30 p.m. The girls were supposed to be picked up at 3.15 p.m. and were reported missing at 5.30 p.m. The dates in this case, both cases occurred on the 13th day of the month and bordered a weekend, Friday and Monday. Some have noted that the dates Elizabeth and Lyric went missing are the reverse dates Abby and Libby went missing. We have July 13th, 2012. 7-13-12. And February 13th, 2017, 2-13-17. Right. The trails. So Libby and Abby and Lyric and Elizabeth all disappeared while on a trail in the afternoon. In both cases, the girls were murdered by an unknown assailant. Cause of death for Libby and Abby has not been publicly released, but two photos, a sketch of a possible suspect, and a brief audio clip of his voice have been released. Cause of death for Lyric and Elizabeth also has not been released. Investigators have stated they have compared notes on the Delphi and Evansdale cases, and while everything is so similar... As I've stated, they don't believe that the cases are related. Despite this, they've also said that they do not suspect the families in either case. And again, some people said, well, there's a reasonable driving distance between these areas, Iowa and Indiana. Is it possible or is this a person who crime of opportunity is a transient traveling person? That has been a longstanding theory in Delphi that the person responsible is some sort of transient person. Does that lend credence to the link between these two cases? Of course it does. But despite all the similarities, I don't think there's enough here to solidly say 
that the same person or people are responsible for both these cases, unfortunately. Unfortunately, even though some of the similarities seem to be just kind of creepy similarities, like the dates. Yeah, absolutely. It's just very strange. And it's unfortunate for multiple reasons. The first thing that's unfortunate is that if this was the same person responsible, there'd be more evidence and maybe be able to catch them. The Second thing that is maybe a little less obvious that is very unfortunate is that there are multiple people capable of such a thing like this, and that's just sickening. As you know, in the previous Delphi update we did, there's a lot of weird murders that happen here, weird cases. And, and I kind of want to recap one. Yeah, we we should go through another one. This was another one that was brought to our attention. Yeah, this one was sent to me about a week or two ago. And I didn't know if I was going to cover it as part of a Indiana or Delphi update until I noticed something really strange about it. So a Chicago man was charged with killing his girlfriend and their daughter. Now, this wasn't in Chicago. He's from Chicago. He's from Chicago. But this actually took place in Lafayette, Indiana, which mm -hmm. we've talked about before. Right. So court documents state that officers responded to a call in the Romney Meadows apartment complex of somebody shot around 11.30 p.m. on July 5th. Now, Romney Meadows, why does that sound familiar? That's because in our last Delphi in Indiana update... That gentleman we spoke about, Cohen Bennett Hans Barron, who was a 21-year-old who escaped his electronic monitoring and then killed his girlfriend, Sarah Zent, and her three children, he was actually picked up at Romney Meadows apartment complex. And then we have a mother and child murder in there a month later. That is insane. Yeah, obviously they're not related, but these two incidences in the same area in such a short amount of time, just absolutely eerie and unsettling. And I'm not sure what it's like to be a local there and just see these things happening time and time again. I just know if that were my apartment complex, and I lived for nine years in an apartment complex, if we have a murderer being picked up and a month later we have a double murder where a little girl's being killed, I'm trying to move real yeah, fast. Yeah, I'd feel so unsafe. I'd feel so unsafe. And I'm sure the problem is a lot of those people can't move. They have to right. just make do with it. So the last thing that we should talk about is that pro trash bag. probably James Bryan <laughs> Chadwell because we do have a Chadwell update. And it's probably not the one that you all are most hoping to hear. So we've gotten a lot of comments. People really seem to think it's Chadwell. I believe it's a much older man. And I think by looking at the, the bridge guy video and the picture, that's just not Chadwell. It's not. The gait, the way he walks, the voice, it doesn't sound like Chadwell. It doesn't look like Chadwell. Chadwell is a sick, disgusting, evil person. But he, in my opinion, is not responsible for Abby and Libby's murders. However, I do quite enjoy covering him because I really hope that he gets the book thrown at him. So that's why I am keeping tabs on his case, as I'm sure a lot of you are as well. So in May 21st, Chadwell filed for a change of venue. His attorneys wrote, and I quote, Chadwell is unable to receive a fair trial in Tippecanoe County, Indiana, as it has been reported that he is being investigated for the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Notably, the New York Post has falsely stated within a photo caption that Chadwell has been arrested for the murder of Liberty and Abigail, end quote. Chadwell's change of venue motion cites other news outlets from outside of Lafayette that have quoted Chadwell's family speculating about whether he might have killed Libby and Abby. The news outlets also speculated about a tattoo on Chadwell. Some of these news outlets broadcast on TV stations available in Tippecanoe County. In the state's response, prosecutors wrote, quote, Although attempts have been made to connect the defendant to the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, alongside negative comments by the defendant's family members and news articles referencing his criminal history, none of these alone, or in combination with one another, are dispositive in suggesting that there is a general atmosphere of prejudice in Tippecanoe County so as to not impanel a fair and impartial jury through voir dire, end quote. Chadwell continues to be investigated to determine if he's connected to the Delphi killings, and recently, Tobe Lesenby confirmed 
adding that there are other possible suspects, but did state that Chadwell is being investigated. However, a few weeks later, he did say, and this was through Liberty German's sister's Twitter post. Yes, Kelsey German actually posted this on the 21st. So it states, and I quote, No further comment on Mr. Chadwell or any other suspect will be afforded in the foreseeable future, end quote. This is a comment that, you know, at first you you look at it like, okay, they're dismissing Chadwell. I find that other part, any other suspect for the foreseeable future. What does this mean? Does it mean that they're refusing to talk about potential suspects in the future? Is it they believe that there is not going to be any substantial information in the future? Are they feeling like the case is growing cold? That statement troubles me a little bit. But again, we as all of you, I'm sure, still very much hold out hope for Abby and Libby's case to be solved. I'm just so frustrated with this case. I am too. And I'm so frustrated with Lesenby. Yeah, so we mentioned this in the last episode that we did on Delphi. Tobe Lesenby's term as sheriff is coming up in 2022. When his term is up and we get a new sheriff, will we have a better handling of the Delphi case? A lot of people hope so. And What if I he gets sh- voted back in? It's possible. I don't know what their terms are like there. From what I know here in Maine, a sheriff can have multiple terms from my understanding. I don't think there's term limits. Is he planning on rerunning? I don't know. A lot of people talk like he's not going to get another term. And so since I'm not from Indiana, I'm going to plead ignorance here and hope that he doesn't get another term. And again, like, even though I'm pretty sure he was cleared, he has admitted himself he was on the suspect list early in the Delphi murder. So some claim conflict of interest there. But but if the Carroll County Sheriff lost his glasses and changed his beard, yeah. you would look like one right, of the suspects. Right, right. And ironically, I was listed as a suspect in the initial investigation, believe it or not. But I digress. If you appreciated this episode and you're listening on YouTube, please hit like and subscribe. This is the best way to help our channel grow. You can also hit subscribe on all the other platforms as well. YouTube especially, we've had a lot of new subscribers, a lot of new listeners lately. We've gotten a lot of comments of people who are sharing our episodes, recommending them to other people. This is how we get organic growth, and this is the only way we grow. We don't pay for advertising to try to get new listeners or anything like that. I don't really know anything about that. All I know how to do is make podcast episodes and put them out, and so... I don't really believe in ads like that. It, they just feel kind of smarmy. Like, I see them sometimes. They'll come up on my Facebook feed. I'm just like, gross. Or I'll go into certain groups and people are just shamelessly promoting their podcast. That doesn't feel good to me. It. I feel like we're targeted with so many ads all the time, whether, whether we're on our social media, watching TV. I'm not going to put you through another ad. Yeah, I don't want to just do that to people. I don't like advertising in general. I've worked adjacent to that world before and known people in the advertising industry. I just don't like it. And I know YouTube runs quite a bit of ads on our videos. We don't really have control over that. So because of that, I don't really want to give you another ad that right. when we have the control to do that. And so, if we ever do end up with some sponsors, we're going to make sure they're ones that are worthwhile for you. Yeah, absolutely. Ones that, you know, we can believe in and not just like some silly money grab. But I mean, as you've noticed, we haven't had any you know sponsorship ads in a while. We haven't taken sponsorship money and it's really because we've just not felt it to be worth it. We want to put out good episodes. We want to put out quality things for you guys and not just fill it with a bunch of ads with things we don't believe in. So because of that, we really appreciate the support that you're helping us grow during this time where, you know, we're doing a podcast for basically free. And I know a lot of people don't like doing that, but um, this is very much a labor of love for us. And with that said, it means so much more that quite a few of you are going that extra step to support us on Patreon, especially, you know, I mentioned this last episode, we're in a new area that we're working on soundproofing and the area is echoey and bouncy. And I'm really working hard to try to make it as good as the closet. I'm trying to get us better gear 
to make us sound professional for you guys so you know you don't have to put up with a subpar quality every week and every dollar we get from patreon goes back into making this better so i'm eternally grateful for you guys let's thank our patrons now Yes, so thank you, Eddie, Rowan, Marky, Holly, Vu, Serena, Chloe, Mark, Tara, Sophie, Karen with an E-A, Neil and Karen, Dave and Karina, Dakota and Kitty, Jen, Mo, Jenny, Nora, Robin, Tom, Kaylee, Alex, Jacob, Victoria, Bailey, Stephen, Casey, C. Asia, Amanda, Patricia, Alexis, Corrine, Sarah, Catherine, Jody, Sally, Kimberly, Jacqueline, Lawton, K. Shay. Welcome, Nat, who... <laughs> became Nat- our patron during recording. Yeah, we were in the middle of recording and we got a notification that Nat became our patron yeah. so welcome nat thank you for doing that you, like <laughs> you have the honor of being the first patron to become a patron while we were in the middle of recording an episode. right i picked up my phone to read the kelsey german quote um, not really quote but her retweet of toe blesenby's quote and i saw the patreon notification so thank you so much and last but not least levi, levi our highest tier patreon supporter there's this lovely picture right now and if you too want to donate to our patreon patreon.com slash the misery machine you get access to all of our secret episodes you get access to our secret discord and snapchat groups and you may even get a postcard a haunted one patreon.com slash the misery machine i know patreon's not a lot of people's things we do have our paypal in the description as well our friend and listener beck who's currently in australia just donated to our paypal so thank you very much thank you so much Beck. you're very wonderful to talk to and i love seeing your travels i love her pictures i know they're oh my god i I love living vicariously through her and her her travels i i do hope to travel as much as her one day but yes thank you so much for that donation again every dollar that we receive goes back into this podcast we do have a buy we do have a buy me a coffee if patreon's not your thing as well yeah so you have several different options if you want to go that route but one last thing a lot of people want us to cover their state in child abuse child murder cases like we did in our home state of maine get us those cases put them in the comment section we are compiling lists we Mm -hmm. are working on this there will be more of those soon so please get those cases out there we're kind of working at a disadvantage because we don't live in those areas it's going to be much harder for us so we need your help with that so please leave that in the comment section or email us misery machine podcast at gmail.com absolutely but until next week we love you we love you Bye. bye